thank you, Robert. And uh, I would like to start by again thanking both Robert and Francois for organizing uh, this I would say, very impressive uh, workshop that has been developing along these uh, uh, two days. Uh, and it's, as I said yesterday in the opening remarks of the conference, I think this is really kind of uh, a milestone, uh, both in the research and in the connection between uh, uh, Israeli scholars, French scholars in the field of uh, medieval archaeology. And as you'll see, I'll be speaking a little bit about uh, connectivity. Uh, but uh, if I may start, before going on uh, very briefly to describe the new developments of uh, the early Islamic period, uh, and I will connect to Chaim's introduction, you know, to every history, every official history, there is the unofficial history. So you have seen briefly the official history of the construction of the Israel Museum. Uh, so let me give you in 30 seconds a different angle of this. The angle of a little child who was uh, living right in the next hill. And uh, suddenly one day uh, these guys came and uh, robbed the beautiful barren hill which used to be our uh, playground for many years and constructed this beautiful museum and we really did not like it so much. Uh, so in a way the official and unofficial history will play also a role uh, in uh, <coughs> my presentation because when speaking about the early uh, Islamic period and uh, looking at the, let's say, official history uh, as we knew it until 30 years ago. Uh, and the reality, uh, as we know it today mainly uh, from the archaeological discoveries, uh, I must start, start with an, a few, uh, I would say, historiographical comments, because this period, as we all know, is framed in between two uh, major historical uh, events. Uh, some people will argue that both of them are very a traumatic and a violent event. Uh, the first one, of course, the 10 years uh, which uh, reshaped uh, actually the whole uh, Near East, uh, the coming of the new power between the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire uh, and uh, conquering the Near East within uh, 10 years and the uh, Crusader conquest, uh, 1099, uh, which is also known as a very a uh, dramatic, uh, violent, uh, abruptive uh, event. Uh, well, there's a little question about uh, the violence that was involved in the Crusader con uh, conquest. The traditional view of the early Islamic conquest was something like this. And I brought uh, you this uh, description provided, this uh, horrific uh, description provided by Sir William Moore, who was uh, an early Islamic historian at the end of the 19th century, but at the same time he was also, uh, <coughs> that, uh, he has a position in the British administration in India. So you, maybe you can feel this uh, description uh, of uh, warriors, uh, column after column, the whole tribes uh, and the succession, women and children and so on and so on. You might feel this, uh, I would say, uh, uh, orientalist, colonialist atmosphere uh, Edward Said will have uh, a lot to say about such description, which actually are prevailing in the historical, uh, official history of the early uh, Islamic uh, period. Uh, but it did not end in this uh, uh, 19, early 20th century approaches, because if you go a century forward, uh, Moshe Gil, one of the most prominent historians of the early Islamic period who devoted his lifetime uh, to the uh, <coughs> deep study of the period, this is how he described the uh, Arab uh, conquest of Palestine in his book, which was published in Hebrew, 1983, and in English in 1992. Uh, it appears that the period of the conquest was also that of the destruction of synagogues and churches, the Byzantine area, very much following uh, the same traditional approach. Uh, just to take you to the uh, archaeological side, we know today, after more than uh, 30 or 40 years of constant archaeology, archaeological excavation, hundreds of sites, not even one site uh, in the area of uh, Byzantine, early Islamic Palestine, not even one site can show evidence of destruction which is connected to the uh, Islamic conquest. Uh, so how come? How, <coughs> how come that we are in such a gap between the historical description and the archaeological reality. 
Uh, and this goes back to the history of archaeology in this country. The upper quotation taken from uh, Robert Stewart Alexander McAllister, one of the founding fathers of uh, the archaeology uh, in the Holy Land, an Irish who worked on behalf of the Palestine Exploration Fund. And this is what you write very, very briefly and shortly about, uh, I have to call it, the Arab remains of Palestine, which are, can hardly be said to be available for uh, excavation. Uh, and actually, that was the situation for many years. Uh, as late as uh, 1987, Ellen Walmsley, uh, who contributed significantly to the archaeology, particularly of uh, uh, Jordan, concerning uh, to the early Islamic period. Uh, and he described the situation of uh, uh, early Islamic archaeology uh, of Palestine and Jor or Jordan remains the poor neglected cousin of biblical and Roman studies. The material culture of the early Islamic period is either largely ignored or misclassified. Little or no effort has been made to establish a soundly based understanding of the economic and social structure of the region from either written or archaeological material. So this really reflects the situation by the end of the 1980s. I can tell you that uh, Ellen Walmsley, which I know for many years, right now is working on a very big volume on the archaeology of uh, the early Islamic period, and he told me that he has something like 5,000 references and footnotes for two excavations or uh, work conducted. So you can see uh, this huge advancement that has been made uh, in the study of uh, this period. Uh, if you want to uh, start the, <coughs> I would say, the process of change, so one of the uh, landmarks uh, of the starting point is this seminal article published by Hugh Kennedy, 1985, in which he started to uh, change the attitude towards what happened between the 6th and the 8th century and the issues of uh, continuity and discontinuity briefly uh, showing with the very little archaeological information that existed in his age uh, that uh, the traditional uh, narratives should be uh, looked differently and that archaeology has to play a major role uh, in this uh, uh, scenery. Uh, by a kind of coincidence, exactly at the same year, the large-scale excavation in Beit She'an uh, began. Not so much because of the scholarly interest, but because of government policy, policy trying to provide employment to the local people of uh, nearby the town of Beit She'an. The result was more than 20 years of ongoing excavation, a uh, huge scale, you can see the earth uh, photography of both the Tel of Beit and the uh, classical and post-classical city, uh, in which two teams, uh, Hebrew University and Antiquities Authority, Johann Safrir and Gidon Ferster, Gabi Mazo and Rachel Banatan, actually exposed the whole sequence of the uh, lower city from the uh, first, second century up to the uh, eight, uh, mid-eighth century. So uh, this worked very much in, in uh, correlation with Hugh Kennedy's article, and actually this 1997 article by uh, Safri and Thurston uh, describes uh, from uh, the archaeological perspective exactly the same processes that Hugh Kennedy uh, was uh, <coughs> pointing at 10 years earlier. Uh, more or less at the same time, the intensi intensification of archaeological survey particularly in the Negev, again, not because of archaeological, there was an archaeological interest, but uh, a political circumstances, the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt, the redeployment of the Israeli army in the Negev, the, this uh, political event triggered uh, probably the largest archaeological survey ever conducted in this country, covering large sections in the Negev, from all periods, but very much focusing on the Byzantine remains, asking the questions of continuity, and apparently uh, the, uh, one of the first places in which evidence of a very clear continuity was provided was through the finds of the uh, Negev Archaeological Survey. Uh, <coughs> the big change in the picture of archaeological uh, activities uh, in Israel concerning these periods occurred uh, with the establishment of the Antiquities Authority in 1990 and the much acceleration of rescue uh, excavation or preventive archaeology, and you can see the numbers. 
uh, which are, uh, I think, absolutely impressive. And for such a small country, uh, like uh, more than 8,000 rescue excavations, including the uh, regular academic activity, more than 50 expeditions per year. Uh, and the main change between an academic excavation and rescue excavation, as you uh, may know, is that in uh, rescue or preventive excavation, you have to excavate everything. You don't have the possibility to choose the preference period. Uh, and uh, the outcome was that uh, two periods were suddenly floating on the ground, uh, the early Islamic and Today we know that the Mamluk period, the post-Crusader period, is also one of the most uh, uh, extensive, impressive, in, the, uh, in which you have uh, the largest number of sites. So this background provided a huge amount of database. Uh, again, you can see the number, not only for uh, Israel, uh, West, Bank, uh, West Bank, also for Jordan, uh, thousands of sites for many periods and when you focus on the second half of the first millennium late antiquity uh, late Byzantine early Islamic early medieval period uh, you are speaking uh, of about hundreds of sites so the big change that occurred in the last 35 years is expressed mainly in the huge amount of data that we have in our hands and with the possibility for a much more accurate reconstruction of the settlement patterns in this uh, <coughs> in, the, in this section in the <coughs> uh, west and east of uh, uh, Jordan between the sixth century and the ninth and tenth century. Even if, without going into the details, you can see that. Uh, more or less the amount of settlements are uh, the same. There are, of course, changes within settlements, uh, but this actually provides us the possibility to look at the big picture and to start uh, refiguring the processes uh, that went over uh, this uh, part of the Eastern Mediterranean in the early Islamic period. So th this is one uh, area in which the archaeological research has been contributing very significantly to the understanding of the big historical picture. Uh, but there is also uh, another much wider perspective which takes us beyond the area, uh, the immediate uh, area of uh, early Islamic Palestine or uh, Jordan, because this flood of new data provides us a, a lot of information about connectivity across, first of all, the early uh, Islamic uh, Caliphate, or the Abbasid, uh, Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphate, uh, connections through uh, material culture, but even in a much wider perspective, the picture of uh, what some scholars call early Islamic network of connectivity, which was created by the early Islamic ex expansion, the connections with China in one hand, the Mediterranean, this uh, Eurasian uh, approach, or even Afro-Eurasian approach, uh, is very uh, significant to the extensive finds that we have here uh, in this uh, uh, part. And uh, speaking about new trends, this is one of the directions I would very much recommend uh, to adapt when looking at uh, the uh, contribution of Israeli archaeology into the early Islamic period, and you'll see this through a number of examples uh, along the lecture. Uh, <coughs> I can just show you the aspects of connectivity along the trade routes between Palestine and Egypt. In between 700 and 1100, uh, with the key sites, uh, Alexandria or uh, Iskandaria of the early Islamic period, Fustat, of course, the newly created uh, metropolis in Egypt, and the centers, local centers in Palestine, mainly uh, Ramle, uh, to some extent Caesarea and its uh, uh, area. Uh, and this has been expressed, for example, by uh, the results of a number of excavations in shipwrecks. Uh, this one coming from Dor, with evidence of uh, commercial contacts between uh, in Palestine and uh, Egypt, maybe the export of Gaum uh, from Egypt uh, to uh, Palestine. Uh, <coughs> so this is just to give you the idea that uh, the finds 
from early Islamic archaeology in Israel are not only connected to local questions, but uh, they are very much interconnected uh, to uh, much larger aspects of uh, uh, medieval archaeology, uh, late antique and medieval uh, historical process uh, on the Mediterranean. And in some way, we have, are also connecting these finds to, I would say, the, the founding fathers of the historical uh, research. I took this phrase for men in a boat from uh, the Horden and Purcell books, the, uh, the corrupting sea on the Mediterranean. But when you uh, take the finds, which I'm going to very briefly show you uh, shortly, uh, to the world of the caravan cities of uh, of Tzev, uh, to Arikiren, of course, Shaman and Muhammad, uh, to uh, Goitain, the Mediterranean societies, and I think uh, above all to Fernand Brodel with its uh, annals and the total history. Uh, so we really can uh, provide a contribution from the fields of archaeology like, to this uh, 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 giant standing on the shoulders of giants, if you want. And I would add to this foreman on about the fifth one. Uh, and this is Peter Brown, uh, that uh, actually, uh, from his angle, changed the attitudes to the world of late antiquity back in the 1970s. But if you follow the editions of his, uh, The Rise of Western Christendom, uh, from the first edition in 1996 to the very last one, 2014, you can see how archaeology plays a more central role in the attitude and the writings of uh, uh, Peter Brown, uh, followed but some, by some recent scholars like uh, Christophe Picard in his uh, Sea of Caliphs and the monumental work of uh, Chris Wickham framing the Middle Ages. Looking at these books, you'll see more and more the uh, impact of uh, archaeology uh, on a much wider scale than uh, the uh, local aspects of uh, archaeology. So I think we have to keep this in mind while looking uh, at the local developments in Israeli archaeology, and I would like to devote the, devote the second part of my uh, presentation very brief, briefly uh, to go from the major urban centers, uh, Caesarea, Beit Sha'an, Tiberias, and Ramla, to the towns and to villages, to the questions of religious diversity. Uh, we, as we saw in the first, one of the first slides, the number of churches, uh, synagogue, and mosque, uh, some touching issues of agriculture, industry, and of course coming to the uh, question, how did it end? What happened in the 11th century? We don't really know, but we have some uh, directions to show what happened to all these uh, systems in pre already in pre-Crusader uh, times. Uh, so starting in the uh, large cities of Palestine, and this unusual angle of map is a quite uh, uh, deliberate one, because as we'll see, there is a connection between Betshan, Tiberias, Caesarea, and Ramla in terms of uh, expansion and contraction of uh, the main uh, cities as a result uh, of the events of the uh, 7th century. Uh, starting with Betshan, the extensive ex excavation I showed you before, the wide colonnaded street typical to the late Roman and the early Byzantine city, second to uh, fifth century, and the processes that started uh, already in the sixth century and were very much expressed in the constructions of the Hisham market in Bet She'an, uh, 738, uh, on the basis of an existing uh, colonnaded street from the Byzantine period, contracting the street, functioning for something like 10 years, and being completely destroyed by uh, the earthquake of uh, since, uh, 8th century Palestine, which hit very hard uh, Bechan, <coughs> January 18, 749, 8 o'clock in the morning, if I'm not wrong. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> and this is marked uh, in many uh, researchers by many scholars as the ending of Bechan. Nevertheless, when you look at the results of recent excavation, only four years later, a new mosque is being constructed on the hill, on the upper hill above the valley. And new buildings, again, reconstructed on top of the ruins, bringing Bet Sha'an 
not again to be the big cities of the Byzantine period, the capital of Palestina Segunda, but a medium-sized town still active when you read Mukaddasi in the 10th century, he mentioned Beit Shan and the rice fields uh, around it, uh, and still very visible archaeologically, uh, unlike all the previous uh, narratives. Uh, so this is the construction of Beit Shan. When you go to Tiberias, it's 40 kilometers to the north, uh, the extensive excavation that has been conducted in Tiberias in the last 15 years, concentrating in the city centers, but also uh, containing many rescue excavations in the southern part of the city show that on the basis of the Roman and Byzantine city the early Islamic Tiberias expanded something like four times from its size in the Byzantine period uh, and this can be explained by the fact that uh, Tiberias uh, or Tabaria was established as the capital of uh, Jund al-Udun uh, the central, uh, the central position of Tiberias is also emphasized by the Congregational Mosque, which was identified and excavated by uh, Katya Tritman Silverman from the Hebrew University, showing the transformation of the city center uh, from its uh, Christian, uh, Roman, Byzantine Christian uh, <coughs> affiliation to a very clear uh, Islamic ones, but at the same time, when you climb the steep hill of Mount Berniki. Uh, the continuity of the church on Mount Berniki is very evident. Uh, even across the 749 earthquake, continuing up to the 10th, 11th, maybe even early 20th uh, century, is how Hirschfeld excavation, uh, providing uh, a vivid evidence for the continuity of the Christian uh, uh, community in Tiberias, an evidence which exists also in the lower city and uh, looking at Tiberias as a new multicultural or multi-religious city, the excavations of the synagogue of Hamad Tiberias, starting in the 60s and, co and continuing uh, in the 80s, show again uh, a Jewish presence in uh, the southern part of the city, continuity of the building, number of phases up to the uh, 11th century and this continuity is very evident in the very large network of uh, uh, elaborated uh, houses, the courtyard houses, this uh, typical house excavated by uh, Walid Atrash, which again show continuity up to the mid uh, 11th uh, century. The, more of the same picture exists in Josh, in Jordan, uh, again one of the most impressive Roman and Byzantine times, colonnaded streets, temples, the, the churches constructed uh, near the temples or by the temples, replacing the temples in the Byzantine period. And in the early 8th century, a new installation is being uh, <coughs> put into the main, uh, <coughs> the main crossword of the a colonnaded street of the city, the early Islamic mosque of Tiberias, identified, excavated by uh, Ellen Wormsley, and you can see this uh, new building which was uh, intruded into the existing framework uh, of the city, early 8th century, continuing up to the at least uh, 10th century, <coughs> and showing this type of coexisting between Christian and uh, uh, Muslim population also in uh, Jarash. Uh, the story of Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima, is a bit different uh, as the only city was conquered probably by some kind of violent conquest in the early Islamic period. The big magnificent city of the Byzantine uh, period containing the uh, octagonal church placed on the temple platform. Uh, this city uh, sharply contracts in the early uh, Islamic uh, period uh, to its uh, present day uh, 10th uh, century uh, wall, as uh, uh, shown by Janaski with the, the recent uh, work in Caesarea and by other scholars like Ken Holom and the uh, Israeli expedition of uh, Avner Aban, Yosef Porat. Uh, looking at early Islamic Caesarea, uh, the picture of contraction is very evident, but at the same time, uh, we are not speaking about abandonment, because the small town of Caesarea still 
was kept along the early Islamic period, at least from the mid 8th century onward, as a very lively center uh, of uh, uh, both uh, industri industry and commerce and uh, a kind of uh, medium sized town expressed in the excavations at the inner harbor by Avner Rabban, which show you the whole sequence and stratigraphy of uh, uh, small streets and dwellings existing right uh, on the bottom of the temple platform throughout the period and up to the uh, Crusader uh, period. The story of Ramli is a unique one because uh, this is uh, the only big city which was uh, established from scratch uh, by the uh, early Islamic uh, uh, administration. Uh, sim very similar to uh, Fustat. Uh, the city has been known mainly from its two or three standing monuments, the White Mosque, uh, which is mainly in its medieval form, uh, the large underground cisterns under the mosque and the big Birgit uh, al the uh, arches cistern, also an architectural landmark in the early Islamic period as it exists uh, today, a touristic attraction uh, preserved from its time of construction in the 9th uh, century. Uh, but very few remains, or actually no other remains exist in the modern town of Ramle, except the one which I showed you uh, as a standing monument. And uh, Ramle was completely unknown archaeologically until the 1990s only six excavations conducted in the city. Uh, what happened with the change of uh, uh, the <coughs> practical legislation on the uh, rescue archaeology after the establishment of the Antiquity Authority is this flood of uh, today's hundreds of excavations. We're approaching the 300 rescue excavations conducted within uh, the limits of uh, modern Ramle. So this is the modern city. This is the limits of the early Islamic city according to one interpretation. There are other interpretations which does not exactly, exactly follow this land. Uh, but uh, the sources of information has been uh, quite tremendously improved with these very large numbers of excavations which provided us the possibility to outline uh, the city limits, some of its cemeteries uh, around. Uh, these are uh, some of the largest scale excavations in Neramle near the White Mosque in the areas uh, to the south of it. All of this area is completely being built by modern construction now. That was the reason for uh, the excavations in this uh, area. As in the southern sections of uh, uh, Ramle, uh, which uh, it has been excavated by uh, uh, Amir uh, Gozezani, the late Alexander On, and others, and uh, provided the possibility to reconstruct the sequences and the uh, different parts of the city. Uh, but on the other hand, Hamle is, uh, has a very bad luck in uh, preservation, because what you see in most of the excavations is only the foundation trenches of the walls of buildings that have been robbed in medieval times. So actually, early Islamic Ramle does not exist except for uh, these uh, patches of uh, floors, some industrial installations, quite a number of them. Uh, Amir Gozezani uh, devoted his PhD work uh, uh, to Ramle, and here and there are sections of uh, artistic representations like fragments of mosaic floors, which also show you uh, the continuity uh, within the change in style from the Byzantine style to the typical uh, 10th and uh, 11th century style, including uh, evidence for a Muslim presence, a mosaic floor with the depiction of a mihrab with the Islamic inscriptions and uh, so on. Uh, so summarizing this section, we can see a kind of equilibrium between uh, these uh, four large cities uh, with Tiberias and Ramle being very much expanded or only established, and uh, Caesarea and Bet She'an contracting, but not uh, abandoned, abandoned completely because they continue to exist as a small uh, town. Now, like the four men on the boats, there is also a fifth city, a very important one, uh, 
And this is the picture of Jerusalem. I'm going to devote only a uh, few minutes to Jerusalem because it has a special uh, case and I understand that tomorrow you will be visiting Jerusalem. But the change uh, after in Jerusalem is very meaningful in terms of urban archaeology and in terms of the transformation from a Christian city to a multicultural, multi-religious center in the early Islamic period. Uh, everybody who knows something about Jerusalem can identify these two areas, the former Temple Mount, now the Haram Sharif in yellow, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, within the Christian quarter uh, in uh, uh, red, uh, and the studies of these uh, two monuments are very large and wide. I'm not going to take you into the uh, details of it. Just to show you the contribution of archaeology, uh, Jerusalem is probably the uh, most extensively excavated uh, uh, historical city in the world. The, this picture of, of the Temple Mount from the south uh, can show you why. And this map, and again the numbers, we're speaking about 18, more than 1,800 excavations from the beginning of the exploration of the city uh, until 2017, which again provides a very good, very good possibility to reconstruct the development of Jerusalem from this famous uh, Madaba map, uh, the Byzantine uh, Christian city, uh, to the creation of the new Islamic center on the uh, Temple Mount, former Temple Mount, now Haram al-Sharif, uh, as it looks today and as it looks in the, uh, let's say, uh, second uh, decade of the 8th century with the construction, of course, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the administrative so-called uh, palaces or centers uh, around it. So the contribution of archaeology in, to this sequence uh, is also very significant, showing you the changes within Jerusalem, uh, <clears throat> including the possibility to excavate, not, of course, within the uh, Haram, but around it to a very large extent, and to some minor extent also within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a project that has been conducted to, uh, with uh, John Seligman for <clears throat> almost uh, uh, 10 years, uh, <clears throat> providing uh, the data to reconstruct the development of changes in the church within the early uh, Islamic period. Very interesting uh, Christian continuity under uh, Islamic uh, regime. Uh, the other aspect which takes us back to you Kennedy article is the contraction, the contraction of the main uh, colonnaded streets uh, of the city from their, let's say, Byzantine form uh, to the early Islamic form, Shlomit, Shlomit Wexler Dolach excavation in the uh, uh, Western Wall Esplanade show very convincingly how starting from the 9th century the streets of Jerusalem uh, contracted, the city shape did not change significantly, but uh, the uh, religious orientation became much more diverse and actually the beginning of the crystallization of the urban zoning as it exists today can be traced uh, in some ways to the early Islamic uh, period and uh, <clears throat> so you can see this in symbolism like the Christian presence in red, the Muslim in yellow and the renewed Jewish presence in the city in uh, blue. Uh, and to support this we have the very famous description of al uh, speaking about Jerusalem as uh, <clears throat> the golden basin filled with scorpions which maybe also uh, apply for some aspects of modern Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing that he is stressing uh, 300 years after the Islamic conquest that the Christians and the Jews are predominant here in the mosque devoid of congregation. So Jerusalem provides a very uh, interesting uh, case study uh, for <coughs> the history and archaeology of early Islamic uh, Palestine. Uh, going very quickly into the <coughs> issues of uh, small town villages and farmstead we can start from, uh, from the hinterland of Tiberias, Kapernaum, one of the most meaningful sites for uh, <coughs> Christianity. Looking at early Islamic Kapernaum, which was largely ignored in previous period, and the excavations in the village, 
the redating of the finds of these excavations by Jody Magnus show very convincingly that the village of Kaplanachum continued to exist between the 8th and the 11th century as a Christian village. But when you go only three kilometers to the east, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, you'll find the new intrusion of the Islamic presence, Hirbet el Minya, a typical uh, so-called early Islamic palace or castle constructed in the beginning of the 8th uh, century, uh, the architectural form very similar to the so-called desert castles in uh, Jordan and uh, Syria. Uh, the rescue excavations provided us with a lot of details about small villages in the Galilee and the continuity of a Christian presence. For example, in Tama, a small village in the lower Galilee, in which a church was constructed uh, in the year 721. And what is interesting, particularly in this church, that the counting or the dating was done according to the new Hijra, to the new Islamic uh, methodology, uh, uh, counting of years. Uh, the same goes for the Western Galilee, another rescue excavation in which Hirbet Chubeka mosaics floor dedication 785. This is the dedication date, which means that the church continued <coughs> even more. Uh, the Jewish presence also continuing in the Galilee, the synagogue of Merot, uh, Byzantine early Islamic uh, continuity up to the uh, seventh, uh, to up to the uh, 11th century. And if you go south, a very interesting site in the Judean lowlands, Chibet uh, Betloya, in which a beautiful monastic uh, church has been excavated, uh, revealing uh, some fine mosaics, evidence of iconoclasm. But sometimes, uh, around the, I would say, 10th century, a small structure is being constructed right by the church, about uh, 30 uh, meters from the church, a small mosque. What was the interaction between these two populations is a big question uh, to be uh, discussed. The same goes for the Jewish presence in the uh, Hebron area, synagogue in Hirbet Susia, which has been converted into a mosque sometimes uh, in the uh, eighth, uh, sometimes in the 10th century. Uh, to conclude this very uh, quick flight over the country, uh, the, one of the most interesting and intriguing sites is the uh, desert town of uh, Shifta, uh, a Byzant typical Byzantine uh, settlement of the Negev, one of the most romantic ruins of the Negev, if you have time to spare, go visit Shifta. And in recent years, uh, a new project conducted by Guy Baroz look back at the sequences and the history uh, of uh, uh, Shifta, asking some very interesting questions about the paradigm of the transformation, continuity, or discontinuity between Byzantine and early Islamic uh, period, looking particularly again about a contiguity between a large uh, church and a small mosque in the southern part of uh, Shifta, the southern church and the early Islamic mosque described already in the 1930s. Uh, and the question, what is going on there? How come that the church and the mosque lives together uh, was occupying many, many scholars. Uh, uh, very interesting Arabic inscriptions revealed there, published by Bill Amor, show that these people were not desert nomads. They were from the upper elite of educated uh, Arab uh, people, maybe coming from outside. Uh, so you can see that the excavation in small site can lead you to very large questions of the interaction between uh, Christianity and early Islam. Uh, the question of transformation between churches and mosques. Uh, the, whether using, sharing or replacing the previous uh, uh, building. And this question has uh, far and wide implication also archaeologically beyond the limits of early Islamic Palestine. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rusafa Sergiopolis in northern Syria, a site which, as far as I know, uh, very sadly does not exist anymore. But uh, uh, within uh, this place until 2011 and the recent troubles in uh, uh, Syria, again, a very interesting uh, proximity between a monastic a church complex and a newly installed uh, mosque, which takes us to the big question of uh, transformation between Christianity and Islam, Jerusalem, as we've seen it, and uh, some of the uh, very modern uh, recent discussion 
about the issues of churches and uh, uh, mosques, which again, as you see, goes beyond the limit of early Islamic uh, Palestine. Uh, I would like to conclude with uh, two uh, uh, short points, looking very briefly at issues of uh, agriculture, uh, because this has been accompanying the research, archaeological research in this country for many years. Uh, and in the last uh, 20 years, we have uh, advancement being made in the possibility, first of all, to date these agricultural complexes, not from the point of view of villages, but the point of view of uh, fields, and also look at a very large uh, scale transformation of agricultural technologies. For example, today we know, today we know how to date much more precisely these typical fields in the Negev Highlands using the optically simulated luminescence OSL methodology. Uh, and we know that from an, a very large sampling of sites that the range of use of the agricultural hinterlands of the Negev Highlands is between the 4th and the 11th, 10th or 11th century, again taking us very close to the uh, Crusader period. Uh, a very interesting aspect in irrigation techniques is the early Islamic uh, farmsteads connected to Kanats along the Rift Valley, the Arava and the uh, Jordan Valley. This is a site near Elat called Enevona in which uh, this uh, vertical shafts which leads into an open uh, pools connected to a very clearly date early Islamic farm established in the 8th century, functioning until the 10th and 11th century. Uh, and uh, this particular site and some other sites in the region takes us to the well-known feature of uh, Kanat, uh, Fogara, Kareza, Flaj, uh, named in different names in different parts of the world, originating in the Iranian plateau probably second century, the second millennium uh, BC, and spreading all over the Eurasian continent from Western China uh, to uh, Andalusia uh, in Spain. And the question of how and when uh, is very interesting one. The only place in this very large area in which you have a system which is accurately dated is the farms in the Rift Valley, uh, the Ava and the Jordan uh, valley farms, which takes you to, again, to this very large question of connectivity, of early Islamic uh, connectivity, and uh, along other features which can be found I, both in, for example, uh, Dunhang, the big archive in Western China, and Andalusia in Spain, also irrigation te technologies are very relevant, and the place of uh, the uh, particular extensive archaeological work that is being done here is relevant, uh, as I showed before, uh, to the very uh, largest question of the uh, early Islamic Caliphate and the Eurasian uh, concept. And at the end, we come to the uh, question, how did it end? Because something happened in this area around uh, the mid-11th century, as Goitain uh, said in one of his articles, the Crusaders, when they conquered the, the land, they found an empty land, and they were almost empty land. And this is very much uh, approved by uh, most of the archaeological work that has been done. If you take Ramle, two successive earthquakes, almost abandonment in 1068, if you take Tiberias, Again, second half of the 11th century, something happened, again, in the agricultural hinterland. Uh, one way to look at this uh, is looking again after uh, a century, going back to en the environmental changes, the role of climate. My colleague in the Hebrew University, Ronnie Ellenblum, has just published a book looking at uh, particularly at the 11th century, and we have now a project with the Israeli Academy of Sciences looking at this uh, problem, asking what was the role of environment and what was the role of the politi political circumstances. Uh, but there's another archaeological uh, uh, <coughs> data which take us to the uh, field of uh, Robert Kuhl and Donald, to the rich assemblage of hordes found in uh, a number of places in Ramle, in Tiberias, from a Fatimid period uh, in Ramle, again dated sometime to the mid 11th century, uh, not only jewelry and uh, coins, but also the largest metal hoard found uh, in, uh, in this country. 
uh, 11th century Tiberius, uh, again second half of the 11th century, the same uh, metal hoard, same uh, uh, aspect of hoard in Caesarea, and the very latest discovery of the huge gold coin hoard in the harbors of Caesarea, uh, Fatimid uh, gold coins in which Robert Cole is uh, currently uh, working on. Uh, and then we come to the questions of uh, uh, how did it end and what happened when this picture took place, the Crusader conquest. What was the shape of the country when the Crusaders came, uh, which is another uh, interesting issue, not completely uh, settled, uh, but we do have now a very large background to deal with this. Because if to conclude, uh, <clears throat> how do you see now the processes and what is the role of uh, early Islamic archaeology in this country? So first of all, there is the issue of connectivity, local connectivity, large-scale connectivity, uh, the Near East, the uh, Mediterranean, and the Eurasian uh, sphere. Uh, there is a very complicated picture of intensification and abatement. Some places really flourish, other uh, uh, decline, but not uh, uh, abruptly, but in a very uh, gradual uh, process. The vitality of uh, uh, urban and commercial uh, activities, going back to uh, the paradigm of Hugh Kennedy, is very much uh, uh, presented in the archaeological funding. Uh, we do have regional patterns. The Near East is not one unit. You have to look at uh, uh, different uh, sections of the uh, Near East. And finally, uh, we do uh, identify a kind of collapse in the 11th century, the reasons of which may, may, may vary. Uh, and if I just, as the final statement, how do we go on from, uh, from now? We have history, we have archaeology. I like very much to use this quote, uh, taken from Irene Gould, she is an, uh, an Central Asian archaeologist working mainly on the interaction between uh, nomad and settler. But uh, utilizing a cross-disciplinary approach to the study of change will develop more parity between archaeological, art historical approaches to material culture and to physical, anthropological and linguistic approaches to studying past people. However, this approach must be spearheaded by archaeology. And I think this trend is very much uh, <coughs> emphasized uh, in the last uh, 25, 30 years, and is very much emphasized by the volume of archaeological work that is being conducted uh, here in this country. Thank you very much. <laughs>